It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. A little later in the show, you're going to hear my interview with Leonard Trammell. His father founded the Commodore Company, the maker of the Commodore 64, and then bought the Atari Company, and we're going to talk all about that. So if you're into that kind of thing and old computers and old technology, uh, I think you're going to really love it. A couple of warnings about that segment, though. We did it over a phone, so it's not the highest quality. And I was still recovering from my Florida trip, so my voice was not really great. And even today, a day later, I'm still not 100%. But, you know, if that's the price to pay for spending a good quality week in Florida, I'm willing to pay that. Uh, My son and I went down there for a week. We drove from Chicago all the way down to the Space Coast, uh, just east of Orlando, in the Orlando area. And we visited uh, Epcot. And of course, I got to spend a little time in the Italy country section of Epcot and talk to a few employees. And one encounter, I was talking to an employee for about five minutes, maybe. And afterwards, my son told me that a couple other employees had collected nearby that I, I, I guess I'd noticed that they were there, but I was trying so hard to speak correctly in Italian that I didn't know what they were doing. But my son said that they were very confused about who I was and why was I there and how was I speaking in Italian. But occasionally I would stop and I would have to ask a question in English and my Italian sounded good enough. They thought I was Italian, but my English sounded good enough that I sounded American. So they were very confused by that. And uh, eventually they asked and we talked about Uh, learning languages. So that was very exciting. I had a great time with that. I always loved Epcot. I I think my favorite food there is uh, from Morocco. Absolutely delightful food. Uh, We also had um, crepes from France. Uh, We had, of course, gelato from Italy and a German pretzel and just things from all these little countries. We kind of ate our entire day Uh, We ate around. We wanted to finish up with dinner in uh, the restaurant in Mexico, but they were maxed out and had reservations only. So we ended up calling it a day, ended up walking nine miles that day and got to see lots and lots of fun things. Now, apparently it was flower season, which some of you would have loved. I'm not the biggest fan of flowers because they smell. (laughs) So I've got issues with smells and odors and perfumes and stuff, but that's just me. Uh, My wife said maybe we should go back sometime in the fall. Apparently they have an annual wine event and and she likes to drink wine. So maybe we'll do that some year. Of course, I got to visit my nephew who lives um, in the Space Coast area around Palm Bay and Melbourne. And my brother came over from England, so got to hang with him a little bit. And he's trying to buy a house in Florida and he thought he had one, but it had roofing problems. So he's going to still work on that. We also went to this place that I'd never heard of before called Forever Florida. And we just kind of happened to find it on TripAdvisor and it was close enough that we went to it. And it is a private ranch slash nature preserve that has almost 5,000 acres in central Florida. And they have camping, they have horseback riding. Those are two things we did not do, but it is pretty cool that you, you can do it there. We took a ride in their custom vehicle around and saw alligators and they explained uh, operational details because it's a, a working working ranch. See, I told you my, uh, my voice was going a little bit. It's a working ranch and they have uh, cattle there. They have horses there. Uh, very fascinating. And of course, they also took us around into 
the part that is the preserve. So this place is just massive scale, very informative, very entertaining, very educational, and something different than what you might normally do in Florida. And of course, the funnest thing about it all, they had zip lines. So we got to do a zip line adventure. Uh, we also did a zip line adventure at the Brevard Zoo. I keep calling it the Brevard County Zoo, but apparently it's just called Brevard Zoo. So lots of great fun there. And when we wrapped up that trip, we had the opportunity to stop in Nashville, Tennessee for Nanocon, Nashville Nuns Convention. And I had a talk, uh, a workshop on how to money. And I kind of figured maybe four or five people would show up and the room was full. There was no chairs left. Uh, we eventually had to get a couple more chairs for the last couple people to sit down. And I just fielded questions like it was a call in show and people would ask things about their investments or ideas or what is an index fund, why stocks versus bonds. We had a very nice time with that. So I'm very, very flattered that so many people showed up to that. There were quite a few people who were listeners to the show. So thank you for being there. And there were a lot of people who were new that had never heard of the show and apparently just thought it was nice to see something other than atheism being talked about. Of course, the convention had a lot of things that weren't just atheism, which is a real nice thing about that convention. So I'm assuming they're going to hold it next year. If you're anywhere in the middle part of the United States, you can drive to it because it's in Nashville. Uh, Go check it out. Uh, Nashville nuns. I'm sure they'll have videos from this year. The other thing I did was an 18 minute talk on Bitcoin. I tried to take the two hours of Bitcoin that I did back in December when Bitcoin, remember when Bitcoin was $20,000 and I told people not only to not buy it, but if you own it, get the fuck out and get out now. And we may have to talk a little bit more about that later this show, but I had 18 minutes to go over that and I thought I had shrunk it down enough, but I probably didn't. And the speaker two spots before me in their 18 minute talk, talked 25 minutes. So the speaker after him and then me had to go short to try to get the show back on schedule. So I did too much too quickly and raced through this presentation. But apparently, surprisingly, a lot of people liked it because it was a ton of information and it explained a lot about how Bitcoin worked. A little later in this show, we have an interview with Leonard Trammell. He is the son of the founder for Commodore, the computer making company that made the Commodore 64. He also, uh, his dad also then bought Atari and rescued it and, and saved it from bankruptcy. Very, very fascinating stuff. Uh, he himself, Leonard also worked at Atari and helped rescue it. Great, great stuff. If you're into old school, I mean, talking old school, we're talking 80s uh, computers and video games, I think you're really going to have good fun with that interview. And we also talk about about business and competition and how it's always this constant struggle between uh, different companies. So hang on for that. We also have a little segment on what to do, because we did before a few weeks ago, what to do if you have next to nothing or very little, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And so this week, there's a segment on what to do if you have between maybe fifty to $200,000. And of course, this wouldn't really apply if you're close to or in retirement. That's different investment strategies. So just keep all that in mind when we get to that segment. A couple other things real quick on Bitcoin. Literally just got this link from Philip Kaiser. Uh, a friend of mine who I've known for years, who's helped me out with websites and uh, was involved with Dogma Debate and their systems there, sent me a link from, um, from uh, where is this, from The Guardian, uh, a very well-respected newspaper, at least in my, my head it is, where it, it talks about the blockchain. And I've gone over this in detail in the past, so I'm not going to go over it too much, but the blockchain is the publicly shared immutable ledger that contains every and all transactions ever, ever, ever performed. And it's part of the problem, (laughs) ironically, because the bigger Bitcoin gets and the bigger this permanent record of 
every single transaction gets, you have to download this to your computer to be able to verify the transactions and or do mining operations to collect Bitcoins. So this thing becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and maybe computers keep up, maybe they don't. So it has an inherent scaling problem. Well, some researchers recently discovered that there's another problem that I had not heard of before and I had not known of before is that the blockchain can have content or data that has nothing to do with Bitcoin transactions. Now, how this exactly happens is beyond my technical understanding. So I'm so sorry I cannot address that. But this story in The Guardian, it says, child abuse imagery found within Bitcoin's blockchain. So if you Google that, I'm sure this is the story uh, you're going to come up with. It says, our analysis shows that certain content, as an example, illegal pornography can render the mere possession of blockchain illegal. Although court rulings do not yet exist, legislative texts from countries such as Germany, the United Kingdom, or the United States of America suggest that illegal content such as child abuse imagery can make the blockchain illegal to possess for all users. This is an amazing potential problem or real problem, I guess, depending on how you look at it. And it may be a very small content of the blockchain, but it is there. Uh, the article goes on to say that another potential problem is that someone could actually put in links. And there was a claim that there are links to child pornography websites contained within the blockchain. And there is also the potential in the future, no evidence of this was found, that someone could be clever enough to figure out how to embed a virus within a block. And once that block is confirmed and added to the block chain, it becomes immutable and unchangeable. So anyone and everyone who ever downloads the entire blockchain could be theoretically downloading a virus to their system. Based on the current rules for Bitcoin, that blockchain is immutable. It cannot be changed. Therefore, the virus would not be allowed to be removed. So they would have to vote uh, all the users, all based on hash power, the power of the mining, to go into the blockchain and modify it, which is against one of the foundational principles of how Bitcoin is supposed to work. But some clever person could embed a bit of virus on the blockchain so anyone that downloads it to become a miner could then infect their systems with a virus. Absolutely staggering. Um, there's no one controlling this, which is part of the beauty of the system, or at least the idea of the system, but also uh, one of its potential great weaknesses. So keep your eyes on that for Bitcoin. And before we get into the other subjects, the other thing that I want to cover has to do with the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule. Recently, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled basically that the Department of Labor uh, overreached its legal authority in creating the fiduciary rule. This was something that was done under Obama. God, it seems so long ago now. Um, the Department of Labor said expanded the definition of fiduciary to apply to all ERISA type of counts, which means 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, Simple SEP, uh, KEO, things like that. Uh, basically anything that's a tax deferred or a qualified account qualified for special tax treatment. It was partially implemented and then not really, and then delayed and then delayed again. And currently it's on delay for 18 months, starting January of 2018, all the way until the middle of 2019 which basically means to me it's never going to happen. Well, here's another thing that says it's never going to happen is that this court said that this is an unreasonable thing. And I'm going to scroll through here. And I, this is, I'm reading from the hill.com. The title of the story is federal court tosses out Obama era rule requiring financial advisors to act in customers best interest, which is, really the essence of what the rule was, um, but it was a three panel of judges and there were two, dare I say it, 
Republican, at least a Republican appointed judges and one democratically appointed judge, which judges are supposed to be above politics, but not always. Uh, so the majority opinion wrote a couple things here, and I'm going to just read them to you. Only in the Department of Labor's semantically created world do salespeople and insurance brokers have authority or responsibility to render investment advice. And authority, responsibility, and render investment advice are in quotes. So I read them kind of funny to emphasize that. So they're basically saying that salespeople and insurance people, they don't have the authority or the responsibility to render investment advice. So when they sell you shit that cuts into your retirement, they sell you shit that makes them more money than you make money. They're not responsible. They don't have authority to give you advice. Uh, it's kind of buyer beware. It's back to what we had before where the full throttle, uh, no commission is too high. No product is too shitty. Uh, they're not responsible for giving you good advice. It's up to you. That is really unfortunate in a weird kind of way. It is good for Phil, which is kind of sad because it keeps my competitive advantage. And for other advisors like me who have stepped forward and said, we will act as a fiduciary, which some companies were starting to switch to in advance of the implementation of the rule. We'll see if they stick to it because there's competitive advantage for them or if they lapse back into their old ways, which is where I'm putting my money because they can make way more money. If someone sells you a variable annuity and you invest $100,000 and I you invest, you give them $100,000 to put into the annuity, they might make a commission of 5, 10, or even 15%. If you're doing a job like me, would you want to make $15,000 in one shot or $1,000 and have to keep working with that customer year after year after year? You're going to be really tempted to make the 15 and run and just have to find another sucker next year to make another 15% off of. I don't think it's going to change. We're going to lapse back right to where we were. And the only way to stop it now, apparently, is for Congress itself to make new rules. And I don't see that happening. It's not even a possibility with the current makeup. I mean, we can't even get rid of a guy who congratulates the president of Russia on his win as a dictator. So anyway, I'll go back to my uh, legal opinion here. Uh, Another uh, quote in the court's ruling, the Department of Labor in interpretation in some attempts to rewrite the law that is the sole source of its authority. This it cannot do. So they're saying that the Department of Labor, Labor created this illusion that salespeople and insurance brokers have responsibility, which they don't, and they don't even have the power to change the rules. So it's pretty brutal. It's a pretty bad takedown. The one judge that was the uh, counter opinion uh, goes on and talks about how people used to have a lot of their money in pensions and there were professional managers helping them taking care of things. They're now on their own and they need protection. Um, and and it, he goes on and says, this sea change within the retirement investment market also created monetary incentives for investment advisors to offer conflicted advice a potentiality that controlling regulatory framework was not enacted to address. And I agree with that 100%. The current system is not capable of adequately protecting investors. You have to do it. And so I guess, you know, the basic thing is do not, and I'm going to use my air quotes here, do not invest in something you do not fully understand. If you do not fully understand Bitcoin, I don't care how much it goes up. You don't buy it because you don't understand it. I don't understand it. I've tried really hard. I mean, I know some things about it, but if you don't understand the annuity that's being offered to you, don't buy it. If they tell you it's not going to be here in a week because the company's going to realize this is way too good, they're fucking liars. <laughs> Walk out of their office. If you have to read a 150 page document, which I've done, well, I didn't read it because it was 150 pages. I tried to. And you're not going to read it. I mean, maybe you are. 
I can have a listener that does anything, but the average person is not going to read a 150 page contract for a variable annuity. You're not going to understand exactly what you're investing in. Don't buy it. Anyway, I didn't mean to ramble all that. Uh, we're going to get ready to do the thing on what to do with over 50,000. And then we're going to talk to Leonard Trammell about Commodore and Atari. And we're going to have fun doing it. So hang tight. Recently on the show, I've talked about what to do if you're just getting started. And, you know, if you've just got five, 10, 15, $20,000, and especially if you're in your 20s or 30s, just using the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index is the way to go. If you have 3,000 to 10,000, you can get what's called the institutional shares. Over 10,000, you can get the admiral shares. And I had someone write me a very nice email, and I'm not going to read it because they give out personal information. But uh, basically, the question is let's say I have 70, 80, $90,000. What should I do instead of having just that one fund? And so I went over my kind of ideas with that and formalized it a little bit. And I'm going to go over that. So this is what to do with more than 50,000 and maybe even up to 200, maybe even up to 250, 250,000 to keep things relatively simple. And this of course assumes that you are not anywhere close to retirement. And so one of the things that the person had in their email was that they have 10% of their money in the intermediate term bond index fund. And I recommended for them at this point in time to either have no money in bonds or to use short-term bonds. That won't surprise regular listeners. If you want to keep 10% in bonds, it's not going to bother me that much. I mean, I don't see the point in it if your retirement is 20 plus years away. There's no reason for part of your portfolio to make 2% 2% or 2.5%. If you think there's some pending doom coming and you want to have some hedge against it, that's fine. That's up to you. I just know from history, from data, from research that our ability as humans to know when the market's going to go down versus when it's going to go up is really, really bad. I just recently got back from a conference and someone said that they were really worried about Trump. So they're putting more of their money in bonds. And I said, were you really worried about Trump when he got elected? And they said, of course. And I said, well, the market's up 25 plus percent since then. So if you had half your money in bonds, you missed all that upside. So even if the market goes down 20% now, you still probably wouldn't be ahead. Maybe you'd be even, but it might go up still from here. So I I, I don't know. And that's the, that's the risk of this short term stuff. So this is a long term plan. This is not taken into account. What's going on now? That's just also why it's not for someone who is five or 10 or maybe even 12 or 13 years from retirement. This is someone who's 12, 15 years or more from retirement, maybe getting started out because you only have 50,000 to 200,000, which I know can sound like a lot, a lot of money. But if you want to retire on your own income, on your own investments, this is the kind of thing that you're going to need to do. You need to save we've talked about before that 20%. So let me just get into this. So again, this is for someone who's about 35 to 40. Uh, in this case, you know, something between 50 and a hundred thousand. I'm going to start off with about 10% in, uh, the real estate index. Now this at Vanguard, uh, was called the REIT fund and they've made a small change where they're going to be more general and allow the opportunity to invest in a few more real estate related things. So it's not going to be just REITs or REIT companies going forward. They're going to expand it a little bit. It's not a really big change, but I think it's an improvement, which is nice, Uh, but it's real estate and that's just 10%. And if you're on the $50,000 side of this, um, the amount of money you can put in here, if it's 10% is $5,000, which gets you over the $3,000 minimum for what is called the uh, investor shares, and that is VGSIX. And that's a wonderful place to go. If you have more money, uh, you can eventually get the admiral shares. That requires a $10,000 minimum. The only real difference is your expense ratio goes from about 0.26 to about 0.12. So it's lower. So 
if you're in the $100,000 range or greater, you could use the Admiral share versions of that fund, and that is VGSLX. And so you'll have a slightly lower expense ratio, and you'll get to keep slightly more of your return. You know, if you're in the seventy to 90000 range plus, and you want to get the lower expense ratio and slightly overweight uh, your real estate, knowing that you're going to be adding more money in the next year or two, you could go ahead and do that. Uh, one of the other things that can become a problem is that if you've owned a fund for several years and you want to switch to the lower cost uh, but higher minimum um, admiral shares, you might create a tax consequence if you're in a taxable account. So always kind of keep that in mind. So roughly 10% in real estate. I don't really like going over that. Um, and it's just another way to diversify your volatility a little bit. It's not a real big factor. Um, if you only end up with 5% or you end up with 12, you know, somewhere in that range, I really don't like going over 10 though. So 10 or less, I guess. Um, the next thing is 20% in international. The fund I like to use for that is the Vanguard Total International Stock Index Fund. That is VT. I A X and I am fairly optimistic right now on international. So 20% there, if it works its way up to 25 or even 26%, I'm okay with it. Uh, for larger portfolios, I'll break this up a little bit and have international and emerging markets. Emerging markets is more volatile. And again, you have to meet the minimums to get the lower expense ratios and you don't want to sweat some of these little expense ratio details too much when you only have $50,000. The biggest problem is that you only have $50,000. So your goal is to have something relatively efficient, relatively simple to understand, and add more money. That's the really big driver at this point uh, in your portfolio, and you're building it in, for lifelong. Is to don't Don't freak too much out about it, but adding money, adding money, adding money. If you have... $50,000 and you're adding five or 10 or 15,000 a year, that has way more impact than a fractional reduction in your expense ratio. But once you have a total of 50,000 or more, you can use the VTIAX. VTIAX is the admiral shares for international. So again, slightly lower expense ratio. And in the last year, that did really well. It made almost 28% return. I don't expect it to make that every year. I am kind of thinking it's going to be on parity or maybe even a little bit better than the U.S. market over the next couple of years. But you'll notice I'm still only at 20% of your portfolio. It's not 80%. I'm not that confident. But it's, again, a nice thing that sometimes it doesn't do well when the U.S. does well, and sometimes it does really well when the U.S. doesn't do well. So it reduces your overall volatility so you won't see the big swings at least less likely to see the swings. And it's nice to have something outside of the United States. So that's in the 20% ballpark. If you want to go to 25, if you're feeling a, a little more aggressive, not going to bother me. So, you know, all these things are kind of adjustable. So if we have 20% in international and 10% in real estate, which is about 30%, that means the remaining 70%, give or take, is going to be in the U.S. stock market. You could stick with the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index because that's what you had before when you were below 50000 Or you could switch it and split it between the S&P 500 and the extended market. Again, if you're in a taxable account, this could create a tax consequence for you and you would not want to do that. What you might want to do then is use these two funds that I'm going to recommend as a way to incrementally add, leaving the total stock market behind. So if you had 45000 in the total stock market, just leave that and let that grow. But keep that in mind when you're balancing your overall portfolio. So um, the two funds that I like to use over $50,000 is uh, the Vanguard S&P 500 fund. That's VFIAX. And of course, that's the Admiral shares. And right now I have that set at about 42 percent of the total portfolio. 
It is a little underweighted because large cap stocks have done particularly well recently. Not dramatically different than the other segments. So it's not a big adjustment, but it's a little adjustment. So I'm going to have about 60% in large caps and 40% in small caps. Market neutral position would probably be about 75, 25 or 70, 30, but we're going to do roughly 60, 40. So we're going to have a little bit less in large caps, a little bit more in small caps in part because large caps have done well. And in part, because over the long time, small caps do slightly, very slightly better than large caps. So we're going to get a little bit more of that. And the small caps are going to be captured by the Vanguard Extended Market Index Fund. That is V-E-X-A-X. And that's 28% of the total of this portfolio. So let me kind of summarize it once again. 10% in the real estate fund. 20% in the total international, 42% in the S&P 500, and 28% in the extended market, which gives you about 60-40 large cap uh, versus mid cap and small cap in the U.S. So that's kind of where my head is at today. This is March of 18, and you know it might change a little bit over the months. It definitely will change some over the years, but It's not necessarily right for anyone listening to this. This is meant to be some ideas, some things for you to do research on and check out what you want to do. So just some ideas for you, things that you could look at. Go check out those funds. You can find them at Vanguard.com. You can also do more research on those uh, symbols, those five digits uh, at Morningstar.com. And of course, if this all confused the fuck out of you and you just want to talk to me about it, You can send me an email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. I can send you uh, a Word document that has all this listed out, or we could set up a time possibly to talk about it and uh, make sure that it's a good fit or at least in the right ballpark for you. But again, if you're 20 plus years from retirement and you have, you know, between 50 and 200,000, the biggest factor for you is saving more and more money. So if you're off a few percentage points, don't worry about it. Save more money. That's that's always the driver for that. So that is what you can do with investments over $50,000. If you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, and you're 12, 15 more years from retirement. Pace e lunga vita. Lunga vita e prosperità. All right, everybody. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to the Phil Ferguson Show. With me today, I have Leonard Trammell. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. How are you, Phil? I am fantastic, and I have met you multiple times over the years at conferences. Most often, I think, uh, TAM and its replacements. Uh, right. Does that sound right? That does. Now, aren't you on a board of an organization? I am on the board of the Center for Inquiry. The Center for Inquiry. And you've been doing that for a couple of years, have you not? Yeah, I've lost count. I think it's eight <laughs> or something. Very good. Well, of course, uh, like many people, I appreciate the efforts that you've made. And of course, <clears throat> gosh, forgive me, I'm losing my voice. I have a little cold. What is going on with CFI and uh, you know, what's next with CFI? Um. CFI is, you know, continuing doing what CFI has always done. The most recent uh, change is the merger with the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, um, which uh, has actually worked out rather nicely. Uh, The supporters of both organizations are glad to have the extra benefits that the other organization can give to them. So CFI is uh, an organization that primarily tries to get critical thinking and no superstition into public policy. I like it. And I don't know if we said it. It's the Center for Inquiry, just in case anyone was not sure what that means. And it's based out of where? So the, the, the headquarters are in Amherst, New York 
just outside of Buffalo. Uh, the executive offices, because we're trying to uh, affect public policy, are in Washington, D.C. Excellent. And now you guys have recently kind of taken over the the uh, vacuum left behind by the amazing meeting with your Vegas conventions. Does that sound right? I can see why people would interpret it that way. <laughs> well, previously your conventions weren't in Las Vegas, um, but uh, they're there now. When is the next one? The next one is the, I guess it's two weeks before Halloween this October. Very good. And, and is that in Vegas? And that is in Las Vegas. And what hotel? It is at the Westgate Westgate. I remember that being announced last year. So uh, we, of course, had a great time there last year at the CFI conference. And I have very fond memories of uh, you and your wife and me and my wife sitting up probably later than we should have, uh, having a few drinks and solving all the world's problems. I I remember almost all of that except for the solving all the world's problems <laughs> part. Well, Perhaps my, uh, my memory is foggy from yeah. And I do, lack of sleep. I do remember I was so jealous because you guys had planned ahead that the next day you were going to take a helicopter ride to see the, the city and or the Grand Canyon. Is that right? Yeah. How'd, yep. how'd, how'd that work out? Grand Canyon tour and a, uh, and a flight sort of, we looped around over the city, um, back to the, uh, the airport. Um, it was, uh, it was fun. It was, it was really great. The, uh, we had a little bit of excitement. After we uh, we took off in the helicopter, we go ab- over the first spectacular crest, and um, the pilot says, we have a warning light, we have to go back to the airport. Uh, so we went back to the airport, and uh, he was already on the radio with uh, the maintenance people, and they said, uh, turn it off and turn it back on everything should be fine. Uh, and he did, and it was. And we took off and did the flight. Well, I, I will edit this part out for my wife when she listens to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we actually stopped at, uh, you know, one of those booths where, uh, you know, along the, along the strip where they invite you to take the flights, and we kicked it around for a while, and she's just a little skittish, and that probably would have sent her off off the helicopter and I would have been going alone. But uh Well the important thing is that they are incredibly careful. So the uh the warning light we had was not a something is wrong. It was something is wrong with the device that might tell us something is wrong. Ah. Which is why we didn't have to, you know, just set down. Right. Um the the systems are multiply redundant and uh incredibly safe well that is a delight to hear and now i will uh, make sure i mention that to her uh one of the other topics i definitely want to talk about maybe anywhere from a few minutes to a long time because i'm fascinated by it and you and i had this discussion before the show that you know it's a little off topic for my show in general but i do that from time to time i had uh the former uh U.S. Uh, House of Representatives historian on talking about political history. So I we can do almost anything, and I'm fascinated by it. And you know what? My name's on the show, so we're going to do what Phil likes. Uh, Sounds your, like a good idea to me. <laughs> yeah. Y- your dad uh, helped found uh, a computer technology company uh, called Commodore. Uh, tell me about that, or at least what you know about that and when it happened. Yeah, so Dad founded Commodore Business Machines after he uh, left the U.S. Army um, with uh, and got a contract to uh, maintain the office equipment for the uh, Army base that he had been stationed at. And that grew into a, a larger business, and then not only typewriters, but adding machines and all of that. And then as adding machines became uh, obsolete and were replaced by electronic calculators. He got into that business and eventually into the personal computer business. Well, and I was reading, it was just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, he apparently was wildly creative and intuitive to figure out what to make, uh, but 
he had some disadvantages competing against the Japanese manufacturers. Um, and, you know, he wanted to get into typewriters and they kind of outdid it. He got into atom machines and they kind of got outdone. He got into calculators using a TI chip and Texas Instruments realized how big the market was and undercut <laughs> the guy that they were selling their chips to to make their own calculators. Uh, yeah, the, um, the the typewriter business actually went pretty well, and the adding machine business was pretty good. Um, the calculator business was the one where uh, they, the, the entire industry got undercut by Texas Instruments. And uh, my father decided that uh, um, being driven out of business was not something he wanted to do and found another way to get a calculator chip. And that uh, introduced him to a fellow that wanted to make personal computers. So we did. And and what was the very first computer that Commodore made? The Commodore PET. PET. And what does that stand for? Well, it's one of these reverse acronyms where someone thought of what it of the word first and then made something up to fit. It's terrible. It's the personal electronic transactor. <laughs> wow, that that is uh, very creative, uh, and that's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> and that could do what? I mean, was it this really just a fancy calculator? I mean, how advanced were we talking here? And, and this is what late seventies. So this was um, spring of nineteen seventy seven. It came out, and it was a four or eight k um, computer with built in basic and a 40 by 25 character built-in um, monitor. Now, when you so say you could, 4 or 8K of what? Of memory. Of of RAM. Right. 4 or 8K. That seems, by today's standards, to be pretty small, does it not? Well, by today's standards, <laughs> it's not worth <laughs> noticing. Um, how, how, how much memory does a page of text take up? Um, a page of, well, each letter is one byte. So 8,000 characters. So it's a few pages. Okay. So uh, this had the the mental strength of memory to handle, I don't, I don't know, 16 to 50 pages of text. Yeah. And the, uh, and it was, they were primarily used for computations, not for um, word processing. Yeah. And you could also add an external memory device, um, eventually a floppy disk drive, which allowed you to store lots of stuff. And and after the PET was the VIC-20, does that sound right? Right. The VIC-20, the video interface chip, um, was what VIC stood for. And uh, it had... A uh, incredibly high resolution, um, sarcasm intended. Yeah, yeah I, I figured. Um, of 20 columns. Well, actually, 22. That's what the. You get 22 columns of text across the screen on your home TV. And of course, the, uh, the one that put you on the map, uh, the Commodore 64. Yeah, so that had 64K of memory. And uh, basically four times the resolution on the uh, screen. And it did uh, graphics about as well as, you know, old style SD, um, you know, standard uh, density graphics uh, television could handle. Yeah, on, on a nice old fashioned tube monitor. Right. And I remember I, for my senior year of high school, on that... Um, on that machine, I uh, I wrote a twenty page paper, and uh, saved it on the uh, external audio cassette drive. Okay, and that was it was basically like a glorified tape recorder, but it weighed I don't know six eight pounds, some incredibly heavy amount, um, and you'd have to put your pencil in there and wind it back to the beginning and and. Uh, <laughs> remember roughly where you started saving your file and uh it could take quite a long time to save a 20 page paper to a cassette tape yes it uh it could um i actually wrote my phd thesis on a commodore 64 
um, with the uh, um, the floppy disk, so I didn't have those uh, uh, issues of having to rewind back to where <laughs> where it was or or the speed uh, issues. But um, I'm pretty sure my thesis was the first one accepted by the Columbia University Graduate School of Arts and Science that was done on a personal word processor. What what was the word processor that ran on the Commodore 64? Do you remember? Oh, there were there were a bunch of them. The one I used was a piece of software called Paperclip. Uh, d- it, does Volkswriter sound like something? Does that ring a yeah, bell? Yeah, there was probably probably a version of that on there. Uh, and I did that paper, and after I did that, and when I was getting ready to go off to college, I bought the, oh God, it must have been like a fortune, I don't know, three or $400 probably for the floppy disk drive, uh, uh-huh. which had the, what is it, five and a quarter inch disks? Right. That were miles ahead of a cassette tape. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, and they stored <clears throat> stunning amounts of, of data, like 200 K. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was just absolutely, cause it went from 200, then they went to double sided, then they went to double density and right. then, and then they went to the ones that were three and a half inches that ended up being like the 1.44s. And then they went to 2.88. Right. Uh, Oh yeah, just so so much fun there. Now the Commodore sixty four, uh, I had it had a slot in the back. I, th- I think all of them had this, where you could put in a, a game cartridge. Yep. And I remember playing Centipede endlessly uh, on that machine. Yeah, there was there were lots of people that spent lots of time uh, playing games on uh, on Commodore sixty fours. And it also helped me. Uh, for the first time, learn how to do a little bit of programming because I, uh, what did they call the little, were they, were they sprites or pixies or something? Sprites. Sprites. I, I, I learned how to write code to be able to manipulate sprites around the screen on that machine. Right. Um, I wonder if you use the Commodore 64 programmer's reference guide to teach you how to do that. I, I don't remember. <laughs> I just remember being so excited when I could make a little block. <laughs> move across right. the screen. It wasn't anything elaborate uh, at my, yeah, my the, skill level. The sample program in the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide to teach you how to use sprites um, was my contribution to that system. Oh, so it, did did you teach how to move a block around the screen? Was that part of the the guide, or was uh, it more elaborate than that? It was a well. It was a, an image that you could produce with remark statements in BASIC. And then you could take that, whatever it was, um, the sample program that I wrote had a little, um, looked like a hot air balloon that you could move around the screen. Well, I don't remember that, so maybe it was something different. I, I don't know. It was, that, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it was. Gosh, that's it's amazing to think that. We're, we're talking um, early in the mid-'80s, right? Yeah, so, that, so the Commodore 64 came out in 82. Two or eighty late eighty one. Now I understand that it it claims to be, and I have no reason to dispute it. The most, the highest number of units of any computer ever sold. Is that does that sound right? Well, any any single model. Any single model. Okay, so yeah. Today there, there's um, so many variants of a model that. Uh, right, because the Commodore sixty four had, you know, the maximum amount of everything that the system was capable of having um, from the get-go. Um, there was uh, no variation, and that allowed you to get tens of millions of the same device. And it was probably the single most popular computer for a few years, wasn't it? It, it wasn't like... For, for many years. Yeah, because now things change so fast. I mean, you know, you, you buy a new phone every two years or every year if you're really uh, up on the technology, and computers last often only a few years. This thing was around for a decade. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think the last one was probably made in the mid nineties. Wow. That, that is amazing. And this is the company that your father founded and, and was involved with. And, uh, and, and unfortunately through some hard times had to sell some equity to another person. Um, and that may have actually led eventually to him leaving Commodore itself. 
It did. Uh, do you want to share any details on how that went down? Well, the, the company was growing by leaps and bounds. Um, it, uh, in the, the, I guess the last quarter of 1983 had reached a rate of a billion dollars in sales. And the, uh, the person that my father had sold some equity to uh, was the chairman of the company. And he was quite interested in being able to take advantage of uh, all sorts of perks that the company had, like a company jet and the like, um, for basically personal use. And my father did not approve of that and said, as long as I'm president, you can't just use company resources. So the chairman said, okay, bye. So you're so, out. So Yeah, and dad just left. Now, I, when I was reading up on your dad a little bit, uh, he uh, he's uh, from Poland and right. uh, actually ended up in concentration camps with World War II. Is that correct? Yeah. So he was um, born in 1928. Uh, so when uh, Poland was invaded by the Germans in September of 1939, he was, you know, 11. And um, being Jewish, he was... Uh, scooped up and put into the ghetto and eventually into uh, concentration camps and uh, various work camps. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm very impressed because this is, you know, a pretty rough start to your life <laughs> uh, to have to oh, deal, yeah. to deal with that. And then, you know, he just never stopped fighting and scrapping and uh, was a low cost uh, leader in the industry and uh, ended up running one of the uh, biggest computer maker companies, at least at its time, uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it was it was pretty impressive, especially considering that his formal education basically stopped um, when the Germans came in when he was eleven years old. So, uh, so he went through all this stuff, Commodore, and at its peak, or, or at least at the peak when he was there, because I don't think it really got much bigger or better after he left at it. Right. Uh, it did not. Yeah, he, he retired or or left the company. And decided to open right. up his own company. What was that name again? Tramel Technologies Limited. Okay. And he was doing that. And then he got an offer he couldn't refuse to buy what? Atari. Little company you may have heard of. <laughs> and um, so, from uh, Warner Communications. And when we were talking about this that night in the bar, I, it was just blowing my mind because, you know, Atari and Commodore were the two things that, you know, at least as far as electronics and computers, uh, were very big part of my childhood. So how did he get to buy Atari? Cause it's a big name and he's just starting out with a brand new company again. How does that work out? Well, um, Atari was in some incredible financial difficulties. Um, they were actually at the point where they were losing $2 million a working day. So they were losing money at, at a rate of literally billions of dollars per year. And this was threatening to um, bankrupt Warner. So they were quite, e quite eager to dump it. And uh, not very many people thought that they could um, actually get anything useful out of it. Um, but my father uh, thought he was up to the task and um, cut an amazing deal and got it for basically a song. Now, Atari was already a household name at this point, right? I mean... It was the second largest or the second most recognized brand name in the world after Coke. And how, how does that? How does a company like that end up losing money? I mean, what, what was wrong with it? That's a really long discussion. Um, but basically, they just overextended themselves in every way you could imagine. Uh, my, my favorite example of silliness at Atari, um, my first week there, I come back from lunch, and there is a phone message from a company called Delphi Associates um, asking me to call them to discuss their contract, and they want to make sure that they're going to get paid the next month. Um, Delphi Associates was the world's first psychic consulting firm uh, okay they had a ten thousand dollar a month um retainer with atari for psychic consulting 
wow. and they wanted to make sure that that Atari would continue to pay. And and did you pay them? Oh no. <laughs> Was that um, and not and not because we refused to. It turned out that their total contract was over the limit uh, where contracts would be automatically transferred from old Atari to new Atari. Um, so that contract was not in our uh, um, realm of operation. So I told them who to call, um, and they went Should, in. Shouldn't they have known? <laughs> well, yeah, they, they, they should have. Um, in fact, when I was, I, I told them, you know, they wanted to send me a bunch of information to explain how valuable their um, their services were. And I, I told them my my name and how to spell it and the address. And I said, but you already knew that, didn't you? And he just said, that's not funny. <laughs> well, so they were so valuable that Atari was losing a couple million dollars a day. Yeah. They, their psychic consulting was so incredibly... Um, useful for running your business at Atari was losing two million dollars a day. Well, well not that... not the best uh, <laughs> not the best indicator. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's not going to be in your uh, pamphlet when you go to pitch another company. Hey, we help bankrupt Atari. Right. Although ten thousand dollars a month is not two million dollars a day, so they yeah. were not responsible. But they certainly didn't help. Yeah, yeah. They they definitely didn't help. Now. So your dad bought this business. Now, did you work at Commodore? Well, you did work at Commodore because you were talking about the programming thing that you made. Uh, I assume then you started a job at Atari. Yeah, actually, I um, I did not work at Commodore um, during that time. I worked for Commodore for a year between college and graduate school, where we designed the uh, the first machine we mentioned, the Commodore PET. Right. Um, and then I went off to get a PhD in astrophysics. Um, and was, you know, peripherally involved in, in contact with the, uh, with the engineers. So um, I was talking to one of the uh, documentation people, and they were looking for people to write programs for the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. So I, I did that, but just, just because I, I could, not because I was working for Commodore. Sure. And then did you work um, at Atari? Got my degree and yes. um, went and joined uh, Atari. And what did you do at Atari? My official job title was um, Vice President of Software. Uh, I guess these days, using the current nomenclature, I would have been Chief Technology Officer. And I think you told me some story about staff reductions that you were involved with. Yeah, well, part of the um, the way that you lose two million dollars a day is by having just an enormously larger staff than you actually need. So Atari had something like twelve hundred people working for it when they were when it was purchased by our group, and it was down to two hundred within a month. I mean, I want to make sure I can I, I can comprehend this. You went from one thousand two hundred to two hundred people in a month, right? And and you, which was which was pretty traumatic. <laughs> oh, I, 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 well, at least for a thousand people, it was. Uh, and, yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't fun for the people doing the firing either. No, no, I so I've had. I remember uh, walking into one of the buildings where we were going to. Um, interview all of the video game programmers that they had. There was about 60 of them, and we needed about a dozen. So we had to figure out you know, which four out of five to, uh, to not keep. And as, we, uh, as one of the other people and I walked in, uh, someone had gotten on the paging system and announced that the Imperial Stormtroopers have arrived. Very nice. Yeah. Um, turned out that that guy was one of the people we kept. I thought that's what that's, if I remember that story correctly. Uh, how, yeah. how does one decide? I mean, what was your criteria in that environment to figure out who gets to stay and who doesn't? Um, you get to know them as much as you can in a, in a couple of hours. Um, look at what sort of work they've done. Look at the breadth of their experience. 
compare that to what um, uh, you know what we anticipated our needs were going to be, and to see what they thought their career path was going to be like, and look for compatibility. And um, I'm going to mostly uh, assign it to the fact that Atari had a bunch of really good people, and I don't think that there would have been a bad selection, um, you know, with a couple of uh, of you know minor exceptions. Uh, so the the 60 people were all so good that it would have been hard to fail at uh, at picking. Uh, you know, a dozen that would uh, would work out. Yeah, because I know I've been in a position in the past where, at uh, a couple times, I've had to lay off thirty or forty people at a time. I mean, this is only one small part of the company, but um, it's pretty traumatizing for the fire-er. <laughs> uh, yeah. a, little, a little more traumatizing, of course, for the person losing their job. At least for the most Absolutely. for the most part. Um, so you guys really whittled away the size of the employee base and at. I, I guess I know the name Atari is out there today, so everything was peaches and cream, or what else happened after that? So it went pretty well for about a dozen years, um, but we had been trying to turn the company into a computer company, right? and this was uh, at the time when the IBM PC was becoming the dominant computer, um, and we just could not withstand the uh, uh, the PC juggernaut and when we pivoted and tried to uh, return to Atari's strengths of video games uh, Nintendo had just started up or started really becoming the, the juggernaut that it was um, so neither of those approaches worked and we wound up uh, selling the company and uh, it sold and it changed hands a couple more times and now the game company owns it? So actually, um, it was sold to Hasbro. Um, Hasbro sold it to a couple, to someone else, I don't remember who. It was eventually bought by a French video game company called Infogrames, who changed the name of their U.S. subsidiary to Atari. And then it went broke. And the name has been purchased by the Infogrames people, um, but under a separate uh, um, legal entity. And they're just trying to do something based on the name. There, there, is, there is nothing in common between the Atari that exists now and uh, the Atari that people remember from their childhood. Yeah, because I, I would assume if I buy... An Atari game. I mean, who, who is who is selling that game? Who who gets a who gets the two dollar profit if I buy an old an old school collection of Atari games? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> some some distributor along the way. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's gotten passed down because I, I know there's uh, simulators that you can buy and packages of games that you can have on your phone that you know have ten or twelve Atari games. Um, right. So most of those are licensed to this new company. Okay. Well, it's just a, a fascinating story. And I'm assuming that at some point when you guys got out, uh, you were able to leave with more than a couple of nickels, hopefully, and, and, and did all right. Um, nickels, possibly even dimes and quarters. <laughs> very, very good. Uh, what else can you think of that you want to tell us about Commodore or Atari? Uh, it's, it's been remarkable over the years the number of people that have told me that their first introduction to computers, which you know gave them their sort of their life's direction or their career direction, was one of the machines that I had been involved with. Uh, it's that's rather uh, kind of spooky. It's a little weird, yeah. um, and it's pretty uh, enriching as well. Now I can't remember what year it was, but two, three, four years ago, I think it was a TAM conference in Vegas. There was also a concurrent conference for Commodore collectors or Commodore fans. Yeah, Comvex. Comvex. Com yeah, the Commodore Vegas Exposition. And and you left TAM, I think it was, for yeah. part of a day to go give a talk at another convention. Yep. 
Um, yeah, that was that was really weird. I had gone to uh, the Maker Fair, and there was this booth of retro computers, um, including a bunch of Atari and Commodore stuff. And the person running it, um, I don't remember how, but found out who I was, and I thought he was going to fall down and kiss my feet or something. Um, and he told me that there was a... Uh, a show in Vegas, this convex thing. And he asked if I was going. And I said, I, I don't think so. I don't know anything about it. When is it? And he told me the dates. And I said, oh, I'm going to be in Vegas anyway that weekend for TAM. And he went, great. Um, will you come by? I said, I don't know. Maybe I'll see if I have time. And a couple of months later, I looked at the convex website. Yeah. And on the <laughs> list of speakers, I was listed at the top. Um, and they said Leonard Trammell may appear, and that that gave me top billing, which was just very strange. That, um, that, but I went. <laughs> and Did uh, you give a talk was, as well, or you just walked around for a while? No, I, I um, actually what I did was a Q&A. Okay. Yeah, which I think is up on YouTube somewhere. I, I thought you mentioned when you came back something about people were walking up to you with Commodore 64s and markers and having you sign them. Does that, am I remembering that correctly? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that, that has happened multiple times. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have signed keyboards and Commodore 64s and all sorts of fun stuff. So in case my listeners have one still in their basement or something, what's a Commodore 64 worth today? Um, nothing <laughs> or very, very little. It's, because there were so many of yeah. them, um, it's not a collector's item. Well, so I, I live near the Computer History Museum um, in Mountain View. Yeah. And there are a few machines they say they don't want any of because there are so many of them. And one is the Commodore 64. <laughs> they just won't even take them. Yep. Well, it, it's funny because uh, as I was you know, kind of reading up again uh before our interview, I was looking at these machines, and uh, especially the uh, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred was the gaming system that I had. Uh, right, and I, I I look back, and part of me is thinking now as a financial planner, how many thirty and thirty five dollar games did I buy in the nineteen eighties, and how much would that money be worth now? Because <laughs> the game's gone, right. but uh, I had I had hella fun. So, and that's uh, that's what it was. That's what it was all about. Yeah, that was the, the the one game. I don't know if you've ever heard of Maze Craze. Uh huh. The most incredibly graphically simple, I'll call it game, but we would play that uh, hours and hours on end because up to four people could race through a maze as a square. <laughs> Nothing fancier than that. You were just a block, um, and you'd go through these mazes. Uh, that was just so much fun for us. Well, the, the human mind's ability to assign agency to simple visuals is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, and in fact, storytelling exists because you don't actually need graphics um, if you have a story. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, so so gameplay is uh, in many ways much more important than spectacular graphics. But the spectacular graphics are pretty to look at. They they are indeed. They've come a long way, that's for sure. Uh, is yeah. there any topic that we haven't covered, any, any, anything at all that you want to discuss? Uh, with regard to the you know, Commodore and, any, and Atari any, and all that stuff? Anything. Yeah. Um, no, I just, uh, not not really. I, I came on to, uh, you know, to answer your questions. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that uh, having... Uh, a nice, vibrant, uh, interesting, and diverse uh, group of people in the uh, skeptics and humanist uh, atheist movement is a is a great thing, and um, doing what I can to support it. Well, Leonard, thank you so much for being on the Phil Ferguson show. I, I greatly appreciate your time. You are most welcome. <laughs> But there was one performance this year that stunned me. It, it sank its hooks in my heart. Not because it was good. It was, there was nothing good about it. 
but it was effective and it did its job. It made its intended audience laugh and show their teeth. It was that moment when the person asking to sit in the most respected seat in our country imitated a disabled reporter, someone he outranked in privilege, power, and the capacity to fight back. It kind of broke my heart when I saw it, and I still can't get it out of my head because it wasn't in a movie. It was real life. And this instinct to humiliate when it's modeled by someone in the public platform, by someone powerful, it filters down into everybody's life because it kind of gives permission for other people to do the same thing. Disrespect invites disrespect. Violence incites violence. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. Okay, go up with that thing. Okay, this brings me to the press. We need the principled press to hold power to account, to, to call them on the carpet for every outrage. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. All right, it's that time of the show to wrap things up. And of course, once again, the show is longer than I want. I know some people love it, but here we are. I do have one review on iTunes. And of course, if you can spare a few minutes, if you are getting value from the show, of course, you can recommend the show to your friends. A lot of people tell me about doing that. You can also go leave a review on either iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, This one on iTunes is from out of Africa, one, two, three. And I'll just read it here to you real quick. I really enjoy this podcast as a 55 year old guy. I'm always looking to learn and reinforce sound retirement financial planning advice. And as an atheist, I learned something from the broad range of guests on the show. Phil's mix of skepticism, financial planning, and humor are a great way to start the morning. End quote. Thank you, Out of Africa 123, for a very delightful five-star review. I appreciate it very, very much. I have at least planned for... The next episode, you notice I didn't say next week because I am having a hard time doing this once a week. But the next episode, uh, a topic I was going to cover today until some fun things came up with the court ruling and Bitcoin and all this other stuff that I had to figure out how to cover. I have received uh, emails and I've seen ads for uh, American funds, which is actually a family of funds that is not too bad. I mean, if you have American funds, you're probably doing okay. Can you do better? Maybe. Probably, but they're not way down on the crappy end of performance. So that's nice. But they sent me, uh, or I've seen ads, sent me a link about they have five funds that have beaten the S&P 500 index from the very beginning back in the 70s. And we're going to dig into that. Is it true? So check into that for the next show. And I think I've actually run out of things to say and run out of time to say it because I have a pile of work to catch up on. That's what you get when you go on vacation. But I do appreciate you listening. I thank you very, very much. If you can leave a review, if you can tell a friend about the show, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And hopefully very soon, I will see you at the American Atheist Convention in Oklahoma City. Please feel free to come up and say hello. And if I do not know your name. I meet a lot of people. Please forgive me. Introduce yourself. Say hello. I would be honored to talk to you in person. Until then, ciao.